Why can't you just admit you was wrong, huh? Why can't you just say, Charlie, I was wrong? Wrong? Yeah, wrong. Where was I wrong? What did you say? I said, where was I wrong? Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rowling. Each episode of The Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. We are at episode 47. We're back to Cole's selection. What did you choose? I chose The Pope of Greenwich Village from 1984, directed by Stuart Rosenberg, starring Mickey Rourke, Eric Roberts, Daryl Hannah, Geraldine Page, Kenneth McMillan, Burt Young, M. Emmett Walsh, Jack Kehoe, and Val Avery. It is about two Italian-American cousins who live in Little Italy, one who aspires to own his own restaurant, and one is a schemer, always hustling. They have their eyes set on one big score, but find themselves out of their depth when things go awry and they are in Dutch with the local mob boss. It begins by playing our song. Summer Wind. Just two sweethearts and the summer wind. Which you forever ruined for me by showing me that clip of Martin from The Simpsons singing it after his pants are pulled off in the middle of his wrecked swimming pool. Uh, not ruined. Made it a thousand times better. <laughs> Until that point. The summer went. <laughs> came blowing in. Until that point, it reminded me of this. And always made me feel like I was 14 all over again. Now, that is sullied. So thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. But it starts with the gentle strains of Sinatra wafting through the apartment as Charlie, Mickey Rourke, is getting ready for an evening at work as a maitre d'. Dressing oh so carefully. Everything is detail. Really, this entire movie is detail. But immediately, it sets a carefree tone, don't you feel? Well, no, actually. I don't. Because Summer Wind is not a carefree song to me. Mm. It's more about regret. This also could be one of those very rare instances where I don't know all of the lyrics or have gotten them wrong, but I think of Summer Wind as being more wistful. More of a September song. Yeah. Okay. So no, I don't feel carefree. He is obviously dressing apart from his surroundings, so he's dressing up, so I think there's a disconnect. Well, it's an important bit of characterization right off the bat. You can tell he is a striver. He fancies himself as something a little bit better than he is. And he's clearly poured every scent that he has into this clothing. We are treated to the dulcet tones of Daryl Hannah on the answering machine, who is a bad actress even leaving a message. And there's a moment much later in the film where she basically does the dick move of the century. She's a jerk. You can already tell. You read a lot into a phone message, do you? Yeah. And as it turns out, she will be his most expensive accessory. So Charlie takes a cab to work, and the restaurant is already busy. And he is informed upon arrival that his cousin Polly is late, and he also needs to look out because the old man, the owner, is there tonight, and he's checking the dupes because he thinks people are stealing him blind. And I can vouch, I don't know if you have much experience with the food service thing. I know you did a little bit of it. I have some. It was nothing like this. Okay, and I worked kitchens for 11 years altogether. Restaurants are the Wild West. All of this is right on the money. In fact, every crazy thing you ever see portrayed in media as far as the things that go on in kitchens and behind closed doors in restaurants, not a single one of them is an exaggeration. Nothing is an exaggeration when it comes to The acts that are committed by the people who are preparing your food. So basically everyone in the restaurant industry is a felon, probably. They just haven't been caught. Would be felon. Yeah, probably. Felon in training. I know several. (laughs) And then speaking of, we meet the infamous Polly, played by Eric Roberts. With his beautiful perm, he looks just like Julia Roberts, by the way. He is dancing in the bathroom, playing with his hair. Skinny and hyper and insane and dumb. And as one character says later, he is a little prick. He's a superstar with a superstar machine. 
Have you seen that Bob and David sketch? No. Way. Where David Cross is singing in the mirror in the bathroom? Yes. Kid, you got the goods. <laughs> this is exactly that. He clearly thinks that. Yes, he is very fond of himself. But to the outside observer, he's a clown. Whereas, by contrast, Mickey Rourke glides through this opening scene effortlessly. He is a beautiful human being. He is a singularly beautiful human being. I don't even know how to begin to describe him. For people that weren't there, that weren't waiting for this explosion to happen, he's like a sexy shark or a Robin Hood almost coming to save the day from a bunch of mediocre, bland, leading men. Even all of that doesn't begin to take in all of the things he represented to a particular generation of moviegoers who are waiting for our next Marlon Brando, our next James Dean. It was a seismic shift when this happened. Did you see Diner when it came out? I did. What did you think at the time? I love Diner. I like it less now. I love him just as much as always. I saw it much later in life, and I don't particularly enjoy it, and I love him in it. He is the best thing about it. The rest of them are obnoxious shits that I would probably hit with my car. He is amazing. <laughs> He's amazing. I like the record collection aspect of it still, but that may be about it. They're twerps. <laughs> but again, to bring up the age difference... I was too young at the time, by and large, to see those movies that he was in. So I only, for example, got to see Angel Heart a couple of years ago. You're welcome. It's true. It's phenomenal. And he is phenomenal. And like you, I feel like I'm sort of struggling to really encapsulate how amazing, what a presence he was. You mentioned him gliding through the scene. It seems almost as if his arms don't move. And I don't mean that he is like a mannequin. He's just so damn smooth. And then in comparison, you've got Eric Roberts, who is a force of weird nature <laughs> in this. He's all body and limbs and angles. And I think it's amazing what the two of them are doing together. Well, you just nailed the critical component of this whole film, watching the two of them together. It is not so much about how the heist plays out, whose thumb is taken off. It is all about how the two of them react to each other. And it is the most compelling, watchable thing, I think, of maybe the entire 1980s. If I was only given one performance to get to salvage from all film from that entire decade, it is Mickey Rourke's performance in this, and I will go to my grave defending that choice. Just Mickey Rourke's, not Eric Roberts's performance? If I only had to pick one, it's his that stands head and shoulders above everything else to me. Eric Roberts's performance is great, but if I am forced to pick one that means the most to me, it is Mickey Rourke's. Is that because Eric Roberts, according to some, gave more of an over-the-top performance? No, it's because of what I relate to. There are so many things about... Mickey Rourke's character, and I think him as a human being, that I relate to significantly more than Eric Roberts. I have notes that we'll go into throughout this, but specifically I'm thinking right now about his unpredictability, and most often how that manifests itself in this as his propensity for flashes of violence and the lack of peace in the man. I see much more of a kindred spirit in that character than I do in Eric Roberts. So it's just a matter of how I personally relate to the thing. I could go on and on about these two, but right here in this opening scene, let's not gloss over the contributions of both Stuart Rosenberg, the director, and Vincent Patrick, the screenwriter who is adapting it from his own novel. Each one of those guys is responsible throughout for these little split-second bits of exposition and small but revelatory bits of business. For example, in this opening scene, as Mickey Rourke is making his rounds and sort of surveying the lay of the land, figuring out what kind of trouble Polly is in, keeping a lid on this whole thing, he makes his way through the kitchen and quickly just sniffs the glass that the cook is drinking from. You don't think anything of it again until later when you realize Polly has been feeding the cook vodka all night and Charlie is hip to that because he knows his cousin's patterns. They don't linger on it. It happens so quickly if you blink you will literally miss it, but... There are several moments peppered throughout this story that flesh it out more fully if you are paying close attention. 
And I say he's trying to keep a lid on it, but ultimately he can't do it because Polly and his instincts and his greed are not going to be curtailed by anyone. He's always going to sabotage everything is the sense that we get. He's like a child. There's a fantastic scene where he is trying to explain this to him. Look, the old man is here. I know what you're doing. There are 12 people at that table. I'll bet you there are only six entrees on your check. And this is that first flash of the real chemistry and the comedy between them. It's a really funny scene, ultimately. And, like he continues to do throughout the film, because he is trying to be cute and funny, Polly skates away without addressing what they are truly talking about. So Polly, even for an hour, cannot stop and control himself, and he gets both of them fired because he was padding out the check. He was robbing from the owner. And he has the nerve to be indignant about the whole thing. I'll put their work in this scene. When they're out on the sidewalk having this argument about whose fault it is, about taking responsibility, I'll put this scene up against any two heavyweights you can name that have ever been on screen opposite each other. Speaking of heavyweights, it was originally designed to be Al Pacino and Robert De Niro, right? Right, and Michael Cimino at the helm of the whole thing. Now, this film is occasionally criticized as sort of being Mean Streets light. So I don't know if it would have been a help or a hindrance to have De Niro and Pacino doing this together. I mean, how could you argue against wanting to see that? I know. But in my heart, I don't think it would be any better. I don't know that those guys, at that point in their careers, would have had too much attached to them, would have brought too much baggage and history for an average cinema goer, that it wouldn't have overwhelmed the scene. I think you need guys like this who are beginning, who are just starting, who haven't quite gone supernova like I feel like Rourke was poised to do, to make this work as well as this does. And in this scene, Polly talks about how he didn't figure he'd get caught. Story of his life. If he doesn't conceptualize the idea of consequences, then there will be none. And not only that, he's not wrong. If he didn't think he could get caught, how could you say he was wrong? And what I love is that Charlie, Mickey Rourke, is so upset with him, so frustrated and hurt and angry and disappointed and violent that he cries. Polly makes him cry. That's the other thing I was going to ask you about this. From this time period, can you recall ever seeing the kind of tenderness and affection between two male leads that we see throughout this, all the way from this opening argument to when Charlie is nursing Polly after his thumb gets taken off? The thing it most closely reminds me of, which is not the same, but a few years later, when I was coming of age to see Stand By Me, hmm. to see, albeit very young men, relating to each other and taking care of each other. But again, not the same thing. It can't have that sort of depth at that adolescent stage, I think. Speaking of, though, when you look through this film in different sources, it's billed as coming of age and a thriller. <laughs> Which I don't really I don't really think of it as a thriller, but coming of age, how old do you have to be to come of age? These are men in their late twenties, which is also why I dislike Diner so much. Well, okay, well there's a lot to talk about there. If you feel that way about that coming of age label and ask that question about these guys, and I think it's possible that Polly never grows up until he gets killed, which is likely what is going to happen one of these days. Possibly a week after the end of the film, maybe, <laughs> or sooner. If the diner guys are so annoying for being overgrown children, how can you feel so sympathetic and attracted to these two? Oh, I don't. I never said that I do. When you were talking about relating more to Mickey Rourke, for example, I don't relate to any character in this film. Hmm. Nobody particularly speaks to me. And I think that's the testament to how fantastic the acting talent in this. You mentioned a litany of people when you were doing your synopsis. You left out Tony Musante, oh, my favorite. Yeah, I'm sorry. And Philip Bosco. There's a Absol ton. I mean, you can't knock over a terrible actor in this film. It's just it's a bonanza. Ph phenomenal. So they make me want to watch this, not because I'm particularly rooting for one or relate to anyone. But do you feel the same disdain for them, for instance, that you do the guys in the diner? It's a twerp versus what? Good point. 
the diner folks are a little closer to their college age than these characters are. These characters have a few more years. I don't feel disdain for them because there is so much humor and love in this. I just don't particularly like them or want to be around them if they were in my life. Gotcha. I don't want these for my cousins. I do, definitely. This would be some first-rate cousining <laughs> that would be happening with these guys. I do feel I need to say, though, again, I think this is an amazing movie, and I think everyone's amazing in it. I don't mean to be negative or knock any of these characters mm. or performances. I, I think it's complex and interesting. I'm all for it. I'm always shocked at how little people talk about it. As I was going through doing research, thinking about it after we watched it, there are so few even online reviews for it. There are so few conversations being had about this when I feel like it is one of the most underrated films of the entire decade. Speaking of reviews, the one that I love is Roger Ebert's. And it boils down to, don't tell me this is a film about human nature, because it's not. It's about acting. I totally agree. Uh, bullshit, Roger Ebert. I disagree. I think it is about human nature, but also the acting. These people are out there. Good point. Just because it's not a side of human nature you encounter on a regular basis. I do think it does go to a little bit of a bigger degree. It's than, amplified. Yes, it's amplified. <laughs> he bit. points out everyone's very ethnic. Everyone waves their arms around quite a bit. Everyone has some family member in the mafia. A cousin in this is closer than your mother is to you, which I don't say is, is untrue. But I do think, as he said, it's more about a capital letter behavior movie. Okay. I'll give him that. Okay. <laughs> Back to the Pacino De Niro thing. Who would you cast as each character? Out of curiosity. I would say Al Pacino as Polly, De Niro as Charlie. I think just he's just a little bit bigger, and he can give that sense of being maybe the bigger older, wiser cousin. And Al Pacino can be a little more squirrely, okay. I think. Funny you say that because Mean Streets is the exact opposite. Uh, I don't believe in typecasting, <laughs> so I'm trying to give people a chance. I think we can agree. As much as I love Chimino, he would have been terrible for this. He would have tried to make it too sprawling, too epic. Four hours long. It's a small story and needs to feel that way. Whereas Rosenberg was a perfect choice, I feel like, because by this time he had been doing all of this great sort of small-scale work with Paul Newman. I mean, you start with Cool Hand Luke, that's a pretty big thing. But as they collaborate down through the years prior to making this film, the stories get more intimate and grimier and much more interesting as far as Paul Newman's body of work, in my estimation anyway, much closer to the kind of story that this is telling. But to get back to this scene, before we move on, I just wanted to point out there are one or two little things in it that are among my favorite things I've ever seen on screen. In particular, when Eric Roberts says, where was I wrong? And you get that beautiful reaction shot of Mickey Rourke <laughs> trying to process <laughs> the absurdity of what of he just said and how dense he is and how angry he is. You see his whole face change. It seems like his eyes literally set back in his head because that's the only part of himself that he can back away with at that time. His whole face changes somehow. And it is not subtle necessarily, but watching these two guys go at it hammer and tong in this scene is brilliant. And watching him back him down and make him repeat the bit about, what do you need a suit for? You don't have a job to wear it to. <laughs> that he just lost for them. Yeah. Yeah, that scene is among my all-time favorites. I bet that leads into a scene that is not your favorite, only because we meet Daryl Hannah Bullring <laughs> in the next one. And, of course, they have that apartment that we all know in New York City that's gigantic and also has a mirror and a ballet bar and a uh, boxing... A heavy bag. Yeah. Super realistic. He maintains a certain lifestyle. We find out a lot about his domestic situation. He has an ex-wife and a kid, alimony, child support, in-laws that are gorillas. It's pressure on all sides. Daryl Hannah teaches aerobics like he did in the 80s. <laughs> Everyone did. 
you were on the tail end of that because of when you were born, right? You were probably vaguely aware, but not necessarily participating in the Jane Fonda fad, all of those things. Oh, contraire, mon frere. <laughs> okay. I have done Jane Fonda videos with my mother. I went to calisthenics when it was called calisthenics to go into the makeshift daycare section while my mom was working out. Mm -hmm. We did 50,000 videos in the house and stuff on TV and 20 minute workout and 20 minute workout. Yeah. Don't calm yourself. (laughs) And did you have a leotard and leg warmers and all that? My mom did. I had leg warmers, I think as a joke. Because I didn't know how to wear them because okay. I was still too young. And I think they were too... I probably could have pulled them all the way up to my waist. Do you still have them? Can, no. Can you can you wear them later? No. I can do, get out some of my mother's Melba packets. Quit talking about your mom when I'm carob. trying to be sexy. Hold on. And carob. <laughs> What's sexier than carob? Carob? Yeah. We went through a big carob phase in okay. our house. If you are out there listening and you are one of those people that says carob is just as good as chocolate... Never you are a approach me. You're a goddamn liar. <laughs> Do Mom, not. who hasn't figured out how to listen to the show, so it's okay, unless I play it before. <laughs> well, that's what Daryl Hannah does, too. And I can definitely see her trying to tell someone that carob is just as good as chocolate. As if he doesn't have enough trouble, he finds out that she is pregnant. Not to say that that's not troublesome for her as well. I can't imagine that it's an ideal situation for her either. But as much as I don't like her, I don't care. In this particular She's case. essentially an obstacle to be removed. Who could you put in this to make that character more appealing? I'm sure there are tons. Joanne Worley. <laughs> <laughs> Probably skews a little too old. She'd be a riot, but too working class, probably. It's set up as kind of a wasp. Well, not kind of. She's specifically referred to as a wasp, but a wasp stereotype. So you got to think tall and blonde. Different world. Different world. A lot of those actresses are not coming to mind of that period. The people that I think would be interesting in it would be your Deborah Wingers and your Diane Lanes, but probably not necessarily that other world. Diane Lane could do it. I don't see Deborah Winger doing it. I think you're right about the Aryan aspect of it. Yeah. What that character has to embody. Catherine Deneuve. (laughs) How about her? I'd watch it, but it probably still wouldn't work that well. Anybody come to mind for you? Actually, yes, now that you say that. And she's in the movie. She's in your New York movie and my New York movie. Tama Janowitz. No. (laughs) Anna Levine. She plays the waitress later on in this. Yeah, that's right. She would be more interesting to me. She's interesting, but uh, she's not a wasp princess. No, but she's also not Little Italy. True. Very true. Let's just call it Brigitte Nielsen and move on. Perfect. So Charlie's got family troubles of all sorts. Ex-wife trouble. New girlfriend trouble. The only family he doesn't have trouble with now is Polly because they've reconciled. We get the sweet refrain of Frank Sinatra again and the stickball game. And how is that not supposed to evoke carefree at this point? Lyrics or otherwise. Oh, it definitely does. They're having a great time. I don't know how they can play in pants that tight, but hey, that's not me. That's them. They're having a great time. So they're reconciled. Everything's okay. Charlie meets a friend on the street coming out of the OTB that offers him a job as a waiter. This is significantly beneath his station. He kicks the guy. (laughs) (laughs) Gives him a kick. Thanks for nothing. Yeah. Yes, he will not lower himself to wait tables. Can you imagine dragging that tie through the linguine and clam sauce six times a night? And speaking of wardrobe, how about that shirt that he is wearing? Which one? The Mondrian, (laughs) when he finds out that she's pregnant. The only time he's not in a suit, essentially, after he's just come out of the shower. Did that make no impression? More like, I guess, his Harlequin Bells and Motley shirt. A stained glass window in a super crappy restaurant shirt. We find out a couple more things here crucial to character. We find out that he characterizes this job offer of honest work. When someone tells you they've got honest work for you, it means they have a shit job. That tells you how he views a a hard day's work. I don't necessarily disagree with him. (laughs) And, of course, like we mentioned, we find out that she is pregnant. 
and we see his reaction to that, and he is not pleased. You mentioned earlier that his entire goal is to own his own place. He plans to leave the city as an owner. And, of course, a waiter job is not going to get him there, nor is uh, yet another mouth to feed. You also mentioned that propensity to violence, and the best moment for me is the come over here right now line that he repeats over and over again when he is not keeping his violence in check and then trying to, and his emotions are playing across his face and then trying to sort of win her back as well. Do you think there was a moment where he was trying to win her back? It didn't feel like it to me. Again, this may just be a relative perspective experience thing. To me, it felt like I want to put an end to all my troubles by destroying you and then realizing that that will make things so much worse than things already are. But there was nothing in between as far as a reconciliation. It was either come here or stay safely away. There were no other choices. You saw something else in it? I do think he's savvy enough to have softened his tone because I don't think that he's ready to completely push her away and realize that possibly he scared her as well a little bit. So yeah, I do think he was trying to win her back. And later on, there's a bigger moment of him trying to win her back. I mean, I don't get either one. Why he wants to, I mean? probably would have just kept walking out mm. the door myself. But yeah, I think he is still in that relationship. Well, there's an element of that in all of his relationships, apparently. He's still completely inextricably intertwined with this ex-wife because of the kid. He obviously can't cut loose from Polly. So this is a much bigger overarching theme in his life than just this with Diane. So all of these forces are at work in Charlie's life. These things that they've laid out for us, the mounting money pressures, the fact that he can't cut loose from Polly, the fact that honest work equals a shit job, all of that converges on the point at which Polly offers up this idea for a score. According to Polly, soon money won't be no problem. He's got a piece of a racehorse. Much like everything else in his life, the fact that he has no experience with it and no knowledge about it means absolutely nothing. He came up with $5,000 to go in with two of his friends to buy a $15,000 racehorse Normally they go for 600 grand, but that doesn't tell him anything. And on top of the racehorse, to make these loan shark payments, he also has this idea for a robbery. He outlines all of this for Charlie as they are walking around Little Italy. Great location shots, beautiful cinematography from John Bailey, who was Paul Schrader's frequent collaborator. If you've seen Mishima, that film, you know what he's capable of all while constructing the most gargantuan sandwich you've ever seen in your life. Well, the score is very low level. There is not a great deal of detail provided, which would make me very concerned personally. And Charlie talks about how they are strictly amateurs. I wouldn't even say score. And you definitely can't say heist because it is not the sting that's going to take place in here. But it's set up that really, if any part of it could go wrong, and it sounds like it will go wrong, the whole thing's just going to go up in smoke. There are so many opportunities for this just to be a complete disaster. And so much so that the save cracker, who's really, as he says, a hotshot locksmith, that Polly has recruited for this, Barney, played by Kenneth McMillan, these people seem to be really ill-equipped to handle something like this. And to have Polly be the mastermind of this does not seem like a good idea. And all of that feeling comes before we even know whose money it is. At this point, we think it's just some nondescript business that they are knocking over. We eventually find out they have committed a much more serious infraction than just robbing a hardware store or the local deli. It is a much bigger deal. Because before we know any of what the actual stakes are, Charlie asks... And reasonably ask, is there going to be money in that safe? And that's what I would wonder too. <laughs> a number of times. If Polly is putting this plan together, who knows? He also asks, in one of my favorite lines, is that guy like a wackadoo? <laughs> when Barney is buying <laughs> the sloppiest street vendor batch of noodles and egg roll that you've seen this side of Blade Runner. I'd eat those egg rolls, so they look good. Probably for $1.99 for two yeah, bucks. Yeah. 
It's here that we're introduced to Bunky, played by Jack Kehill, another fantastic character actor. You've seen him in everything. The sting I mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. He's going to visit Bed Bug Eddie, the local mob boss, played by Burt Young. A better name I could not come up with for this character, and especially as Burt Young embodies the character. We see Val Avery at the bar, longtime favorite of mine, a Cassavetes regular on one of my favorite episodes of Columbo of all time. And here is where we find out whatever this money is supposed to be in the safe, it's supposed to be $150,000. Bunky, Jack Kehoe, is supposed to do this pickup. And so obviously it is mob money and it is supposed to be there in this safe. So Polly got it right. Just declined to mention a very important piece of information. (laughs) Another crucial piece of information, Bunky's a cop, a dirty cop, clearly. And so things are getting a little complicated. This scene also has another one of those fantastic bits of business that I love so much, where Kehoe takes a calamari and then wipes his fingers on the napkin in Burt Young's pocket. And I'm trying to read what Burt Young is thinking at this point. What Bed Bug Eddie, specifically, I guess I should say, is thinking at this point. Do you read that as a breach of protocol? Are they that close? I would never touch a pocket handkerchief slash dirty napkin from anyone with Bed Bug in their name. (laughs) So poor hygiene more than anything else. I just would have assumed it was a Chinese finger trap right there, and then that's how he would get me. So everything is moving toward the night of the robbery now. And in the interim... We see a few more of these little behavior things that you were talking about. Polly pulls the horse laxative prank on the cop that towed his car. And in the meantime, Charlie and Diane drive out to the country to take a look at a restaurant. While they are having that conversation, Charlie intimates that this might be a little bit more achievable of a dream than you think. He's got a plan that she doesn't know about. And she asks, is Polly a part of this? Also, quite rightly, totally reasonable question. Always a good question. And she asks him, point blank, when will you outgrow him? And for Charlie, it's family. You don't outgrow people. I think again about this question of, is this a coming of age film? What age are you coming to? These relative maturity levels. And in a moment, we see Polly visiting his dad. And even his dad says, I should have been tougher with you. He's an adult. He's a grown man at this point. But it's too late. It's rough when your dad knows you're a bum. And so do you outgrow people? Should you outgrow people? What does that say about you? Well, I know I mentioned there's a lot of his character that I relate to. But this is the one thing that I do not. I fall firmly on the wasp side of this argument. My world is a meritocracy. You have my trust because you earn my trust. It is not something I freely give you. And just because there is a complete coincidence of family tree here, that obligates me in no way whatsoever. No way. I cannot stress that enough. Regardless of cousin first or third or however many times removed, all the way up to immediate family. If you are behaving in a way that merits removal from my sphere, I will do that. I do not see this, how this works. You do not get to stay if you do not earn it. What I've been struggling with is how to phrase this because I feel like the word outgrow is not the word that I'm looking for. And I don't think that that's what you're describing. Meritocracy seems different than evolution to me. So... There's a discussion later on about these choices that he acknowledges that he makes. He's made all of these decisions. So if he's already come of age, can you really say outgrow? Is there a better word for that? And I don't have it. This is kind of an open-ended question here. Is it more like when will you decide that you won't participate in this life anymore or that you just won't see him anymore? Or that you'll decide that this is just simply not okay. So she's not asking him, in your estimation, when he will outgrow him. She is asking him when he will grow up. Motion is all relative. Even the motion of maturity, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Charlie can evolve 
and because Polly is standing still, or in fact regressing in some cases, it seems like that gap will widen, but is it actually? I think ultimately what she's really asking him is, when will you change? Because the coming of age has already happened. Life has already happened. Whether they want to acknowledge it or not, they're already these grown adults. So there's no further new information to be gleaned. They already know each other. They already know the score, pun intended. And I think she's completely missing the point. A thing that comes up over and over again as a theme is this always being so close but never quite getting there. And Charlie clearly has established this as a motif in his life. So by saying she's missing the point, do you mean ultimately she should see that nothing is going to change and she needs to do something else herself? What she's asking for is unrealistic? Yes. And or, or am I missing the point? Am and I asking the wrong question? I think I don't exactly know what my point is. That's part of the problem. But I think it's just this idea that I have of we're not talking about necessarily lack of maturity, even though that can be a part of it. We're talking about actual character defects okay. that you should run away from. Okay. So it's not just about some idea that maybe she has of, well, we're going to leave this old life behind and suddenly have these great grown-up friends. That's ridiculous. Which leads me exactly to where I wanted to go with the second part of this discussion. Thank goodness, because I was floundering. Is it ever going to be possible for Charlie and Polly to escape New York? This idea that he's going to move to Maine and open a restaurant. Charlie in Maine equals Henry Hill in the Witness Protection Program. Why would either of them want to escape New York? He's thinking more about going upstate somewhere. Even that seems a little sort of unnecessarily genteel for his way of life. But Polly, I cannot imagine going anywhere else. He talks much later on about going to Miami. It's just another mafia stronghold, really. Another flash place. So no, their lives are built around a few streets. Well, they're not the only ones whose situation is like that. You have Bunky and now his mother, whom we meet, played by Geraldine Page, she was nominated for an Academy Award for this performance. For two scenes. That's how great she is in it. Eight minutes total. Powerhouse. Especially when she's facing off with M. Emmett Walsh. That scene is so it's good. the best. But you have these two characters in a similar situation. Lifelong New Yorkers, I get the impression, who have this pipe dream of a year from now we're going to be in Arizona. Mom, I'm going to teach you to play golf. Never going to happen. Even if this terrible thing doesn't happen to him, these are not Arizona people. And not just lifelong New Yorkers, it's generational yeah. New Yorkers. My brother is a parish priest New Yorkers. My grandmother and my great-grandmother, if they weren't immigrants, or if they were immigrants, came here first. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about people who have been there and will always be there. Still, just like Charlie and Polly, they have a dream. They are working this scheme. And, in fact, it centers around the exact same $150,000. So Bunky has been recording himself for some time about what's been going on in his meetings and his ties with the mafia used for blackmail, possibly, at some point, if he needs to. Right. And with other dirty cops. So he's covered from both ends. He's got some insurance. So Charlie, Polly, and Barney go clambering across rooftops to begin the robbery proper. Rafifi, it is not. No. Which is important, I think, in this scene. The fact that they are not professional criminals. We had no planning scene, really, as you would see in something involving a crime of this nature. It all goes pretty quickly. They're all just sort of lunkheads and look completely out of place. Like small-timer amateurs would. Unfortunately for them, this $150,000 they've come to rob is also the same money that Bunky has come to pick up at the behest of Bed Bug Eddie. He interrupts the robbery. They hide. They scare him from their hiding place, which causes him to accidentally fall down an elevator shaft where he dies. And it's just that quick. This is a, such a small time, almost no effort discernibly put into this. They're actually close to achieving it. And cracking the safe and getting the money out, and then this ridiculous freak accident happens. Now, 
Charlie is ready to stop at this point. Barney wants to keep going. Charlie is smart enough to examine the body. He figures out this is a dead cop. He also gets the recorder, which is quite important. And Charlie's reaction here to me is completely realistic. He lays out what the stakes are right now, the highest that they've been, even with the involvement of Bedbug Eddie, which is that they are not professional criminals. They have a dead cop on their hands. Regardless of whether they actually harmed him, which they did not, it's going to be major jail time or death. It's a murder rap. If someone dies during the commission of a crime, it's automatically a murder charge. And again, this is not some slick heist thing where they can figure out a way out of this. This is basically our lives are over as of this moment. And I feel what he's feeling. This is how you or I would react in this situation. The thing that I think is significant about his response is that it puts him on the same level as Polly. We haven't seen him behave this way prior to now, but now that the stakes are this high, he, like Polly does with everything, is deflecting and refusing to accept responsibility and saying, it's your fault, look what you've done, look what situation you've got me into. When he could have said no. In a moment, they're going to have this scene where Charlie is prying out the most important part of this equation, which was that it was Bedbug Eddie's money. And we should mention, they do finish the robbery and do take it. They don't abandon it because of this thing happening. So is it understandable that he gets even more upset because Polly held back that incredibly important detail, (laughs) but he was still deflecting before that, you feel like? Oh, definitely. I can understand now. I can understand. But you're absolutely right. I mean, at any point he could have said, well, whose money is it? Because it had to be somebody's. What business is it that we're going into? And then again, in yet another moment where they are setting out the rules for this money that they did take. It's clear from that second that Polly's going to ruin it again. (laughs) He's trying to basically negotiate. Oh, well, okay, nobody can spend a nickel of this money. Well, we don't have to go crazy either. Can get a suit or two. So, yeah, Polly's going to blow it the first chance that he's going to get. He's going to tell anybody in the world, anyone is going to connect the dots of how Polly heard about this score Back to bed, Bugatti. Everyone's going to be dead at that point. Well, it doesn't take long before word hits the street. Bed, Bugatti, as soon as he finds out the next morning, puts a price on their head and tells his minions to tell everyone. So it is not going to take long before someone is mentioning their names. And parallel to that, the cops with M. Emmett Walsh are on the trail separately. They know that Bunky was wired, so they know that this incriminating evidence against them is out there somewhere because the recording was not with the body. So they go to see Bunky's mother, Geraldine Page. Best line ever, you want to (laughs) fight? Officer, I want her on my team. Yeah, without a doubt. Second only to that, when she's talking about Bunky, says he's as strong as a bar of iron, and he did not get that from his father. Yeah, it's a great scene. Watch it. Watch the whole movie. Needless to say, internal affairs... M. Emmett Walsh and his partner, everyone leaves empty-handed. As bad as things are, right here, Charlie makes the biggest mistake he has made to date. They go to Diane's dance studio, and he tells her about all of this. Don't tell her anything. Don't tell her about the cop. Especially don't tell her about the money. What are you doing? When confronted with this story, she says she is not going to have any part of it. And that turns out to not exactly be true. And she again cuts in with, Polly uses you, and he says flat out, I made my own decision, and I don't want to change. Once again, I would listen to him. She actually strikes him this time. She actually hits him twice. He never touches her. She hits him twice in the movie, once when she's working on the heavy bag, and repeatedly in this scene, to which he responds, hit me again, see if I'll change. And the flip of the other scene when they were arguing, she tries to win him back at the end. She's the one yelling for him. I'm back to relating to him again at this point. I feel like if that is happening, that's what I'm going to say. Hit me again. See what difference it's going to make. What do you think you are going to do? Do you know me better than I know me? What are you trying to achieve? So at that point, what do you do? What is he trying to achieve by going to tell her all of this? 
Well, there is the looming specter of this unborn child. So even if he feels no obligation to her, he clearly has demonstrated how important family is to him. So I think that's what motivates him to go back and do this. It's the wrong decision, but I think it is consistent with his character. It is his child in his mind, and so therefore he's doing what he can to protect it and to make sure it has the best life it can already in his limited capacity. I think at least in part, he just doesn't hold anything back. He's not a liar. Well, prior to the heist, he's being very cagey. He's being very coy about this plan. So he's holding plenty back in that regard. So what is it that you're specifically thinking of? I think at least in part, he is much more about expressing what he's feeling as he's feeling it. Mm -hmm. He's not about constructing some sort of made-up better self or some image that's not him. It almost seems sort of compulsive to say, this is who I am, and just to keep doing it. If that's the case, what is all the striving about and the wardrobe and the aiming for something above his station? Well, I think he explicitly states his desires. I see what you mean. I don't think he's trying to manufacture something to say, oh, this is who I was all the time. He's saying, no, this is exactly what I want, and I'm going to go about doing it, and every single moment of my life is an effort to reach that purpose. Well, the odds of him reaching that goal have decreased drastically because Bedbug Eddie just found out who did this job. Barney's no dummy. He knows that he is not family with Polly, and Polly will give him up. And so Barney is trying to cut a deal with Charlie to make sure the money gets to Barney's kid, which is all he did this job for in the first place. In the meantime, Polly is oblivious. He's at the track checking on his investment, looking after his horse. And Bedbug Eddie has dispatched Polly's Uncle Pete, quote-unquote uncle. He's not really his uncle, but he's been this protector of him since he was a child. He sent this guy with his goons to basically get the information out of Polly. Who were the other people involved in this score with you? Pete doesn't want to do this. He makes it clear to Polly that he would kill Eddie if given half the chance. He certainly doesn't want to hurt this person that he loves, but he's got no choice because Eddie knows that really Pete should have put this information together. So he's there to either find out Polly, give up the others, or I've got to mutilate you. That's not quite right. It's not an or proposition. It's an and I'm going to mutilate you proposition. True. It's or in the sense that give me a name or I'll hang your head on your mother's doorknob. But when it comes to losing that thumb, there is no choice. And once again, Polly has the gall to be indignant about this. <laughs> Why would Eddie want to do this? For what? I just stole money. But it's about way more than money. It's another instance of Polly's short-sightedness. This character can only see as far as what he wants. The neighborhood works a certain way because everyone respects the rules. Old ladies and kids can walk the streets safely at night because... Everyone understands the hierarchy, and nobody upsets that. Taking this money upsets that. It is going against the natural order of the neighborhood. And the fact that Polly seems to have no concept that he's also screwed over Uncle Pete, too, who is a ranking member in this organization, and put everyone he's associated with in danger, it just doesn't even seem to register for him. And this whole time, Pete is really still trying to help him. He gives him a bargain, at least give back a huge chunk of the money. We'll just say that you blew the rest of it. Just give up your friends, give back some of the money, I'll figure it out. And so in heroic fashion, Polly gives up Barney. <laughs> Polly has no honor. He's a weasel. You know that to begin with. You know he's going to give up someone. The only question here, the tension is, does he give up Charlie? In this case, not yet. And they press him hard because they take his thumb. This moment, this scene in this film, may be the one thing that I have learned that has stuck with me from the movies the most for my entire life. The single most important lesson I have ever learned. I would say that a week has not gone by since 1984 that I have not thought this to myself or said it to someone. I know I've said it to you a few times already. It's one of those bits of advice 
no one wants to hear. Nothing ever hurts like you think it will. But I have found that that applies to every single instance of my life, be it physical pain, emotional stress. Nothing ever hurts like you think it will. Nothing has ever been so true to me. Ever. Does it resonate at all with you? I don't know that it might be as significant to you as it is to me. It does. I'm not a huge fan of tough love, unless I'm the one administering it. But there is a little bit of a variation of that sentiment. You said this to me. A few years ago, I was in an accident. And I was banged up pretty badly. And I was really frustrated at one moment because I haven't really been injured before. And... You know, I'm always trying to find a solution to any sort of pain. And you said, sometimes it's just going to hurt. And that was actually the best thing I've ever heard. And I, that's what I think about a lot, week to week. That's what is in my mind. And I tell people that sometimes too. It, I remember, I think I did one of those little shoulder shrugs of, oh, okay. Now I've got the resolve to carry forward. Just to clarify, you still have both your thumbs. Yes. <laughs> well, as often happens in situations like this, when these plans start to go awry. After Ganga <laughs> Sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, the poet laureate of Scotland, Robert Burns, has made an appearance from beyond the grave. That's pretty good, don't you think? That was really good. Not talking to a jerk, you know. <laughs> Things start to unravel for our trio. You know how I mentioned don't tell Diane about the money? Because she pulls off, and I quote myself, the dick move of all time. In an answering machine message to Charlie, she reveals that she took the shoebox full of money and left him $5,000. Okay, let's talk about stakes again. How can she not know that in any other situation, she has killed him? And so we talked earlier about rooting for people or not, and I said, well, I'm not particularly rooting for anyone. I am, however, rooting against Diane. But she's gone. She's taken the money for the baby. So left. she says. So she says. Maybe it's for more leg warmers. I don't know. Funny how she didn't want to have any part of it before, but now that she is free to do whatever she wants with that money, she has no qualms about its source. All breeziness of the film aside, this would make me physically ill. If you did this or someone did this to me, this is terrible. Well, Charlie doesn't have long to think about it. He destroys the apartment and passes out in the middle of the wreckage, only to be awoken by a knock at the door. Turns out it's Polly, straight from the emergency room. He reveals to Charlie that he gave up Barney, Bedbug Eddie knows who took the money, and they took his thumb. They have maimed him for life. This scene is the real litmus test for me. This is the way I can tell whether or not you're a douchebag that I want to have anything to do with when I mention this movie to you. If all you come back with... Charlie, they took my thumb. Is that... If that's all you know of this and what you like to repeat as sort of the tagline and you don't know anything beyond these histrionics and you think it's hilarious, you are immediately telling me that we have nothing further to say to each other. It's absolutely ridiculous because they're playing it at true human drama. I mean, Charlie is crying the whole time at what Diane has done and what's happened to Polly, what shambles their life is in, the danger that they're in. And if all you can do is make a little meme out of it, I think you're kind of ridiculous as well. It is amplified, much like everything else in the film. But how do you think you would behave coming straight from the ER after your thumb has been cut off you're pumped full of drugs, and you are this character to begin with. I know there's a lot of criticism of their performance being over the top, like you mentioned. I don't see that at all. I see it as maybe pushed to the absolute limit of where it should go, but I don't think it goes beyond where it ought to go. I think it's right on the money, and it communicates everything that needs to be communicated exactly the right way. As a nice, muted counterpart to this scene, we then soon have Barney's goodbye to his wife. We saw earlier that Barney was able to get out just in time. And this scene is one of the best for me. It's incredibly affecting. And we understand in a very real way what these stakes were for him. We talked about his kid, the reason why he was trying to get this money to put aside for his family. And he and his wife clearly love each other and want to be together. And they're going to have to separate right now for safety's sake. 
And she says, how did you let this happen to you? And his line is the most heartbreaking for me. I let my whole life happen to me. Yes, out of all the things that happen in this movie that are gut-wrenching and deeply emotional, this scene hits me the absolute hardest. And it's seconds. That's it. It's so fast. But it's so believable. And I think the point that you were making much earlier about how little bits of business, bits of exposition, choices, tell us so much without having to just go on and on. The clumsy and desperate goodbye kiss essentially, is the hardest of all those things. Just even thinking about it right now as we're sitting here talking about it, it's the one thing that makes me want to cry. The rest of it I find fascinating, and it's a really seductive method actor thing that's happening throughout the whole thing, but this is the most honest and true five seconds in the film, in a great film, and it just elevates it that much more for me. So Barney gets on the train, makes good his getaway. In the meantime, Charlie is nursing Polly back to health. There are a couple of instances in the film where we see these nice bookends at the beginning and the end of the movie. We had that moment earlier in the film where he refused to lower himself to accept a job as a waiter, but now that is literally what he has become. We even see him going through the motions, draping the towel over the arm, carrying the tray into Polly to serve him soup, canned soup, and it is his devotion to his cousin that is ruining his life that has now made him accept this role. They talk a little bit about Diane and that whole thing, and Polly tells Charlie, we need to stick with our own kind. Which, in the film, I know what he's saying. He means strictly someone that comes from their culture, that understands how they live, that doesn't necessarily aspire to something else. So you have a true understanding of one another. But did you read that as a larger metaphor? This stick with our own kind thing. What is their kind? I'm thinking back to that moment earlier when they're at the racetrack and Polly is talking about horses, how horses can't make themselves better than they are, like people. Okay. And he knows what Charlie wants. So as he's saying, stick with your own kind like me, the people who are ridiculous aspirational dreamers who will stop at nothing to try to get those dreams as long as it doesn't involve a lot of planning and a whole lot of scheming, rather than people who were already born with these gifts... To me, on a larger scale, that reads like someone who does not want to be alone. That's the person who does not want to be left behind. That, through their own selfishness, wants to keep you at their level. It's that friend that when you're both from a small town and you are going off to college and they are going to stay there and be there forever, that doesn't want you to leave. It's that syndrome. It's that, why can't we just have it this way always? Then I think... That Polly and Diane are essentially doing the same thing, both trying to convince Charlie that the other is somehow a bad influence and the other is somehow bad for their lives, that the other is going to hurt him, which, yes, they're both correct, both for their own selfish purposes, trying to keep him exactly where they want him. So Charlie nurses Polly to the point that he is well enough to get back on his feet and go to work for Bedbug Eddie, adding insult to injury now, he has to go serve him coffee. This is really Burt Young's scene. This is when he shines. And the whole point of this meeting is to get Polly to give up the third member of the group. So he goes into full intimidation mode. Eddie's no dummy. $150,000, you don't keep a third of that and give two-thirds of it away. He knows there's a three-way split. And he has that super great move of telling him sit down no it gets him to switch chairs is that in one of those classic who moved my cheese it, i think so from Dale Carnegie. <laughs> and Polly won't look him in the eye either with good reason in that little kid style too is what, the way that i think of it and because eddie's insane bed bug is a nice choice but in this case he makes me think of a tick he's like a big swollen tick on the belly of this neighborhood and he is absolutely crazy. Everyone knows it. So no one with any sense would look him in the eye. Because who knows what it would provoke. Now we don't see Polly give up Charlie in the scene. We mm. don't explicitly see that. We know he does. We know he does. He does not possess the constitution to withstand this sort of third degree. But it's one of those great choices that we often talk about. About what the director shows versus what they don't show. You don't necessarily see it happen. But you see... Polly in the aftermath of that 
making arrangements. He's a little more frantic. He's very uneasy. Something has happened. We don't know exactly what. It's left to us to imagine how it went. It's now race day for this amazing thoroughbred that Polly has invested in. So Charlie and Polly go out to the track, and Polly, like you're mentioning, is being squirrelier than usual, pretty evasive, and he wants Charlie to go to Miami with him. He bought tickets. And he's clearly trying to dodge some people that he sees at the track. To be fair, they cut off his thumb. (laughs) Absolutely. You're not going to want to go hang out in the clubhouse with them. But the assumption is there's more information that we're going to learn here. Mm -hmm. And we will in a bit. As often is the case with Polly. He's holding something back that we need to know. For now, they're trying to figure out how they're going to bet on this horse. Of course, Polly wants to go all in. Charlie wants to hedge the bet a little bit. We see the race happen, and in true Polly fashion, his horse loses by a nose. I would say Polly and Charlie fashion. That whole thing about you're always just this close to being a good person. True. This race metaphor, it may be a little bit on the nose, actually, for me. There's a really fine moment in this scene that I like where Mickey Rourke is just regarding Eric Roberts. It's a longer take of him just looking at him and trying to take in his craziness. He's trying to make sense of his cousin, and he's just looking at him for a long time, studying him. And it's a little more of that stuff that I was mentioning earlier about how often do you see in this time period two male leads demonstrate this sort of true, thoughtful affection for one another. Because there's some bemusement in his eyes, I think, and love. You can see the love. Mm -hmm. Polly has his own peculiar charm that's undeniable. There's a moment much earlier in the film that I love. Nothing's happening. They're just walking arm in arm down the street. It's great. As happens again and again in these guys' lives, that spell is soon broken. They still, though, have some degree of success because Charlie actually did hedge the bet. He bet across the board. They actually won $20,000. But, as Polly says... Charlie, there's something I gotta tell you. The bed bug knows about you. Sorry. (laughs) Superman would have broke. I mean, come on. And it is confirmed once and for all, Polly has no honor whatsoever. Would you break in this situation? They've already taken your thumb. It's your third cousin. Trying to go through degrees of cousinhood in my head. Is it different in Virginia than in Little Italy? Probably not much. Oh, that's true, I guess, maybe. No. Back in the holler. Yeah, full disclosure. I did think that's how it was spelled. Holler? Yeah. I thought hollow was, was, I didn't know that was the word. Depends on where you're from, I guess. My mother's from Wildcat Holler. Okay, let's not say cousins. Me. Let's say it's me. Don't, don't put me in this (laughs) position, sir. They've already taken your thumb. I'm coasting. A wise man once said to me, nothing ever hurts like you think That's it true. will. So, sorry. But you know they're going to Bed kill me. Bedbug knows about you, Cole. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I got us tickets to Miami. What more do you want? I tried to get you to go with me. Well, I guess all that's left is for me to get dressed up and go see Bedbug Eddie. Because you've got potentially the ace in the hole. Charlie has the tape from Bunky. So he's got this bit of leverage, hopefully. I love this showdown, this final scene between Burt Young and Mickey Rourke. You're wondering, how crazy is Eddie? Is he crazy enough to take a chance to whack Charlie and roll the dice on whatever might happen to that tape? Or is this tape that strong of an insurance policy that Charlie can walk straight up to the man and say, you're not going to do anything. Here's how it's going to go. And does Charlie have enough stardust left on him that he could actually get away with this? But, as plans after Ganga Glay... Polly. I see. You keep saying that. (laughs) I don't know that that's how it goes. Look it up. Okay. Okay. Polly brings in the coffee. We see him giving a little side eye, so we know something's happening. Polly should stick with the racetrack because he does not have a poker face. We see Eddie drink that coffee in one go, realize Polly, taking Uncle Pete's wonderful suggestion, has put lie in the coffee. And it's again, one step forward, 20 steps back. Charlie says, I had him. (laughs) If you had just stayed out of this, I could have had him. We don't know that for sure, though. Is that true? 
We have no idea. Personally, I don't think it would be true. And I actually kind of side with Polly on this one. I think that was the best possible move. We don't see Eddie die, though. No. Pete tells him, run like hell. And the last we see of them is the two of them walking down the middle of the street as Frank Sinatra queues up again. And it's almost happy-go-lucky. It's banter. It's not the discussion of two men who should be running for their lives. Things are looking up, as they say. (laughs) Technically, he says, things could be a hell of a lot worse. (laughs) And you need me. The most direct spelling out of their relationship in the whole movie, in three words, right there. Now that we're here, curtain comes down. What do you think of the ending? How does it work for you? It was definitely unexpected to me. Even though the film isn't this breathtakingly paced crime thriller, it's not downbeat all the time. I still was kind of surprised that, oh, whoa, okay. Oh, the end. And left to our own devices to figure out what's going to happen five minutes from now or two weeks from now or two years from now. So I think tonally it works. And we don't need to be actively rooting against everyone. It's kind of nice to see, well, you know, I didn't really want to see them get murdered. Is that the, is that the best thing you can say for how you feel Things about these characters? Things could have been a hell, of a hell of a lot worse. That's true, I guess. I always thought it worked just fine. Because to me, nothing that happens in that entire coda is out of character. Everything is still exactly like they've demonstrated all the way down the line. Paulie is going to do something that he didn't think through very well, having it turn out that he snatches defeat from Charlie's jaws of victory right on the brink of being that complete whole person, that success. And in their obliviousness and devotion to one another, they just stroll on down the street to the next thing. I think it is perfectly within their character, the way it goes down. I think you could pick up immediately and make just as compelling a sequel from right there. But I don't think it's inconsistent, and I don't think it's that jarring of a tonal shift. The one big question I have left for you is, who do you see as the lead in this? Because if we're going by the credits, Eric Roberts has top billing. And he is clearly the catalyst. Nothing happens in this movie without Polly. Without Polly, this is a story about Charlie saving up money to buy a restaurant. Maybe he makes it, maybe he doesn't. It's a much smaller scale domestic drama but it is not the story that we have here. So who is the lead? And I didn't notice that until you pointed it out. I wasn't paying attention to billing in the credits, and I just assumed it was Charlie. And I assumed the first time I watched it from the first moments that, oh, Charlie is the Pope of Greenwich Village. And then I thought, well, maybe they're saying Bed Bug Eddie is. And then it comes back, no, he is the Pope of Greenwich Village. He's not always the driver of the action, But to me, he is still what passes for the heart and conscience, even though there's some ebb and flow with that. And I don't think I could sustain watching an entire movie just centered around Polly at every single scene. (laughs) I know who the lead is. Okay. It's that bulldog. (laughs) The lead is clearly Mickey Rourke, which is why I chose the film. He was it for me in the early to mid 80s this movie particularly this performance and others he gave around this all that is ground zero for the point where i was beginning to develop my own tastes so do you think that this falls into the category that we've talked about before in other episodes of the experience of seeing this and the impact that it had on you was really about when you saw it making all the difference for example, if it came out right now, would it still have the same impact on you? The performance is undeniable, but the fact that it came at that point in my development was galvanizing. My deciding to love this film and his body of work through there, that was the beginning of my fledgling adult approach to cinema. Really the first time I was conscious of not approaching something or looking for something because my parents thought it was good and I therefore would be interested in it, but something I went out and found on my own. And fortunately for me, it was something this great and it is just seared onto my brain. I'm thinking about a phrase that you used in the Enchanted Cottage episode about a movie coming along just when you needed it to. Mm -hmm. Does that ring true for you? It is exactly that thing. 
because prior to that, you've got a rumbling, <laughs> rumbling. You've got Heaven's Gate, Body Heat, Diner, Rumblefish, all of these smaller roles that are starting to get my attention. Who is this? And then, like I mentioned before, this movie just exploded into my consciousness. It was like a bomb going off, similar to the way I feel about Do the Right Thing. But rather than that teaching me to see outside of my own culture, this was the thing at that age that taught me most to examine myself. Do you think that's a thing that people encountered with other matinee idols, or is it something else that people are seeing in their Brandos and in their James Deans? Is it, oh, I wish I was cool? Because it's not that exactly for me. I'm seeing something in this performance that I already felt in me. I'm relating to it, yes, but it is not, wow, I really aspire to be this person. The first thing that makes me think of is that litmus test idea again. If you look at James Dean and you think, that's who I want to be, then clearly you didn't actually watch Rebel Without a Cause. Mm -hmm. Because he wears everything in his face and his heart on his sleeve, and he is constantly expressing his turmoil and sadness and hopes and dreams. He's not some aloof, removed, cool guy. But that's a different discussion. Okay. Well, maybe that thing spoke to them the way this spoke to me. Maybe they really were seeing that, understanding that, and the turmoil that he presented on screen, he was embodying what they felt. To me, that's how this functioned. That was this whole thing of, I do not feel peaceful. And I'm already aware of that at this age, and it's different than teenage angst. But going further with Charlie's character, and with what I feel about Mickey Rourke too, do I want to be peaceful? No. I have no interest in that. To me, that is boring. To me, that ends up with me caring about whether or not the HOA thinks I have the best mailbox and the kind of person that thinks what Eric Clapton plays is the blues. I want no fucking part of it. So it gives you that outlet to see these things inside you expressed in a really interesting way and gives you the opportunity to then question them further. Everything that I thought possible about being an adult when I was 14 through, say, 17 when these films were happening to me all that potential is on the screen with him and i was with it all the way through even on through to the desperate hours i think that was actually my first mickey rourke film in the theater <laughs> i was even willing to go with the accent on a prayer for the dying that's how all in i was on this on this guy and since then we've got Marv in Sin City, and we've got the wrestler, there's always that threat that he's going to be able to tap into that thing that only he can do that is beyond charisma. It is something else entirely. It is something that only a handful of people have ever demonstrated to me that they possess. And of those people, he is my favorite. So that's why this is on our list. So over the course of this show, we're going to talk about Mickey Rourke a whole lot, probably. This will not be the last time. So... To give equal time to his co-star, for my recommendation, I am going with Star 80. From just the year before, 1983, directed by Bob Fosse. Starring the aforementioned Eric Roberts and Mariel Hemingway, and it is about the story of Playboy playmate Dorothy Stratton and her murder at the hands of her husband, Paul Snyder. Eric Roberts had a super strong run, too, through this time, all the way from this through Runaway Train. But I love him in this, when you're talking about that weird energy that no one else can capture. He is such the embodiment of the small time hustling creep. There is no one who has ever played that type of character better than him in this movie. He is so oily and ultimately deranged. It is heavy. It is not fun because we know the ending going in and so that dread is with us from the very beginning because we know what all of this is moving towards. But even with that, with Fosse's sensibility added to all that, it's a pretty fascinating thing to watch. I really like it. What about you? I was thinking more about family complications, and that led me to You Can Count on Me from 2000, written and directed by Kenneth Lonergan, who is an amazing playwright. And I think you can feel that solid structure in this. It's with Laura Linney, Mark Ruffalo, and Matthew Broderick about a single mother whose life is turned upside down when her little-seen younger brother comes back to town. This one was a big deal for me in 2000. This was in the period when I was working full-time 
in professional theater. And I knew who Kenneth Lonergan was, and this came out, and I was just entranced by it. I think it works well on so many levels. The performances are fantastic. The story is fantastic. Those things that were not told, but were given to understand. And that sensibility, that true love and companionship that comes through in the performances of Laura Linney and Mark Ruffalo as the brother and sister Mm -hmm. feels lived in and right. How do you judge that? being an only child, like we've mentioned on the show before. I have a younger sibling, so a lot of this resonates with me, the Pope of Greenwich Village, all the way through something like You Can Count On Me. I have that in the back of my head all the time. Since you don't have that direct experience, what still makes you gravitate to these? I think you can at some point at least recognize something that seems true. If it's speaking to you as true, you've got to go with it. And that's what this does. And you're right. I don't have siblings. That's another part of the film that I don't necessarily relate to because I don't have that sense of loyalty to the ends of the earth for many people. And I don't have that built in with family members because it just doesn't exist. So what I'm saying is, watch yourself. (laughs) And that is, once again, two great recommendations, Star 80, and you can count on me. And that brings us to the end of episode 47. If you would like to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We are on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. Just search for our name in any of those venues. We are on Twitter, at lantern underscore cast. And I would like to take a second to say thanks to everyone who shared the show or gave us feedback since the last episode. Grindhouse Dave, Drew Tavendale and the gentleman at Fuds on Film, Leanne Kubich, Fifth Cast Studios, the 365 Flicks Podcast, Eric Parkinson at the podcast This Must Be the Place, Stephen Presley at the Thunderpop Podcast, and Keith Rich. I wanted to say an extra special thanks this time for the two reviews that folks left for us. Thanks to Adam Dodder and to Andy Wolverton. Andy sent us a really nice email in addition to that review. It means a great deal to us anytime anyone reaches out to let us know how much they enjoy the show. Thanks for that, Andy. And if you find yourself anywhere near the Anne Arundel County Library System in that neck of the woods in Maryland, Andy hosts a really great movie night for the library system and they just did one of our favorites, Ace in the Hole. So if any of our listeners are in that area, go check out one of Andy's movie nights and say hello to him from us. We are on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and Google Play, and if you would like to leave us a review at any of those places, we would certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at the website magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. 